Hello, my name's Jane and welcome to an Active Birth Workshop. The purpose of the workshop is to show women how fantastic they are at labouring and giving birth. Women have been doing it for thousands of years and it's a fantastic design. The men, they're the hunter-gatherers. We women are designed to give birth. Now tremendous changes happen to your body during pregnancy. It's not just about the big bump that grows, but your hair changes, your skin and nails alter, your breasts alter, your mood swing as well. But there are changes within the body and one of the things that changes is this structure, the pelvis. It's a series of bones joined by ligaments. There's a big ligament at the front here, this is called the symphysis pubis ligament and these will change, they will soften with the effects of the pregnancy hormone. So in later pregnancy you may find that you get discomfort here, walking up the stairs, getting in and out of the bath. At the back here we've got the sacroiliac ligaments. So at the end of the day when you get that low down backache, that's due to some movement here with these ligaments. Last but not least you've got the little coccyx and that's just hinged on a small ligament there. Now people talk about women having childbearing hips and when they do they're talking about the width of your hips here. They're of absolutely no use whatsoever when it comes to childbirth. What is important is the inlet of the pelvis but more importantly the outlet and that is formed by this structure here, these two bones here and the coccyx. Okay, so I've got Stevie and Richie here to help with some of the exercises to uh, show about the shape of the pelvis. I'm Stevie and this is our first baby and I'm 22 weeks. Okay guys, so if we just get down to the floor, to the pillow and we'll do some exercises to show you how this pelvis moves. So what we're going to find first of all are the childbearing hips at the side here, okay? So if you can just find those bony bits at the side here. And then what I want you to do is bring your fingers down so you've got your fingers on your pubic bone at the front. Okay, and then what I want you to do then is pop your other hand on the coccyx. And then I want you to lean forward as far as you can. And tell me, can you feel anything happening when you lean forward? Yeah, your coccyx is lifting. Fantastic, mm. yeah. Can you feel that bit? Yeah, you feel that lift, yeah. Yeah, that's grand. Okay. okay, right. So we're going to go for this bit now, these little bony bits in the middle of the cheeks of your bottom. So if we can just find those, dig in there, find those. And then when you've got them, just sit back on your heels. And then what I want you to do is I want you to spread your legs as wide as you can and tell me, can you feel any movement in those bones when you do that? Yeah, you feel they move apart, can you? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Right, one last exercise on one knee and one leg out to the side. That's grand. Get your hands on those bony bits again <laughs> and spread out over that knee, okay? Can you feel any movement in those bones when you do that? Yeah, it's quite a similar sort of opening. Yeah, sort of movement. yeah that's great. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, what we've done with those very simple exercises is shown that when you are upright, leaning forward, and you open your legs either symmetrically or asymmetrically, you move these bones of the pelvis. That moves and these bones move. And we know in doing that that you'll increase the size of the outlet of the pelvis by up to 28%. So when the baby's moving down through the pelvis, it may get stuck here and here or on the little coccyx. If you move those bones out of the way, it'll make the passage of the baby so much easier through the pelvis. Okay, so now we've done the positions down there, what you can do is actually see how women use those when they're in labour. So I was caring for a lady uh, a little while ago who had had a caesarean section with her first baby. She'd done fantastic with a push-in, she got all the way to that stage, but the baby just wasn't coming, so I took her to theatre and unfortunately couldn't deliver the baby by forceps, so she had a caesarean section. Second time she came in, fantastic, up and around, moving about, swaying. And then her husband was standing in front of her, so she got her arms around his neck, sort of swaying around like this. But then she kind of started to wave her leg in the air, which threw me a little bit. So she said she wanted something to put her leg on. So I got a chair, and then what she did, she just put a foot up on the chair, and then with each contraction, she just started to rock, okay? And that's just what we've been doing on the floor, okay? Making her pelvis bigger. So she carried on like that, her partner was in front of her, poor midwife, on the hands <laughs> and knees on the floor, and that's the position she gave birth in, like that. Now that baby was a pound bigger than the baby when she had the cesarean section. Okay. So any ideas what position she might have been in when she was trying to give birth the first time around? 
sat on her bum on her back. Lay down on her back, yeah. So there's a fair bit of weight here now, okay? And if you lay on your back, you're closing down those bones, okay? So in that first position, she was actually shutting down the pelvis and making it too small for the baby. Second time around, in that position, she made that pelvis bigger and a pound bigger baby came through. So if you take nothing away from the workshop, apart from this one thing, when you're in labour, you need to be upright. Standing, squatting, sitting, kneeling, it doesn't matter, but you must be in that upright position. Look at what happens if you lay down. Look at the shape of the pelvis. You're having to push uphill, and pushing is hard work. So stand up. Look how the pelvis changes shape and how gravity is helping with your pushing. So when it comes to labour, there are the three Ps. There's a passage, which we've just talked about, there's a powers, which we'll talk about later, and there's a passenger. And this is my passenger. Now it's very important that the baby's head is in what's called an occipito anterior position. So this part of the baby's head, the occiput, is in the anterior part of the pelvis. So as the baby's head moves down, it brings its chin down onto its chest, making the diameter of the baby's head smaller and make it easier for it to pass through the pelvis. Now unfortunately nature can be a little bit unkind, especially with first time moms, and put the baby in an occipito posterior position or a back to back position. The problem with that is if the baby's head moves into the pelvis, instead of bringing its chin down, it tends to bring it into more of an upright or military position. And very few babies will actually pass through the pelvis in that position. So what you have to do during the pushing is rotate the baby all the way around so that it can come out in that anterior position. Now what we do know is that this position is more common now than it used to be. And that's mainly because as a nation we are much lazier. We tend to use the car rather than walk to places. And when we're sitting watching television, instead of being in that nice upright position, we tend to slouch on the settee so we're nice and comfortable, but unfortunately that doesn't help from the positioning of the baby. Because this part of the baby is the heaviest part, so every time you're slouching down in that position, it's encouraging the baby to turn round into that back-to-back -back position. If you go back a generation or two, well, before we had vacuum cleaners, people would get down on their hands and knees, scrubbing the carpet, sweeping up, and so they would be in a nice forward position, and that would bring the baby round into that nice forward anterior position. Okay, so we're going to just do some exercises now to show how this is a good position. So for this, I've enlisted Kate and Matt to help me. Um, this is our first baby, and I'm 32 weeks pregnant. Okay, so instead of lounging around on the settee at night, this is much more beneficial position to be in. And why is this a good position? You're sitting forward, your legs are open so it's opening up your pelvis, leaning forward. It brings that baby around and fits in a nice position and it also helps with that back ache, yeah. okay? And in this position, Matt is able to give you a really nice back massage during the evening time or, or when she's in labour. Okay, and just roll around, that's it, that's really helpful. It helps move the pelvis and gets rid of that back ache. And again, same thing for you, Matt, you can do some nice massage, hold her nice and safe there. And the great thing is you're sitting down and yeah. chill out, so that's great. Okay guys, so that looks really comfortable, how does that feel? Feels nice and comfy and safe. Yeah, yeah, and it looks okay for you yeah, then. I'm yeah, comfortable. The other thing you can do is you can pop your head down onto the pillow, okay, and then you can sort of sleep between the contractions, and Matt, you can just carry and give it some nice gentle massage. Make sure you keep wiggling your hips, Kate, from side to side, because that will help with the backache and help get that baby into a nice position. All the rooms on labour ward have ensuite facilities, so sit on the toilet the wrong way around, rest your head on a pillow on the system, it's lovely and comfortable, you can go to sleep between the contractions, your partner can sit behind you and give you a lovely back massage, it's really calm, it's really soothing, it's a great place to be. Now most of you will have bought a bear for your baby or you may still sleep with a teddy bear yourself. So bring that bear in with you, because I would guarantee that if you're having your baby at home at some point, you would go and sit in that nursery in a chair hugging that teddy bear. Music's really important when you're in labour, so bring some music in with you. You can bring some CDs, it's very important to sway and dance when you're in labour. Most of you will have been and bought a brand new nighty, but you're not going to be in bed, you're going to be upright and moving around. So what you need to do is have something big, baggy and comfortable 
that it doesn't matter if it gets soiled, it can be thrown away. But bring something in that you've worn so it smells of home, it will make you feel relaxed, you'll be comfortable in it. Most women in labour don't end up getting changed into anything, they just end up in their ordinary clothes, taking the bottom half off. But if it's hot or you're not comfortable with that, then you need something big, cool and comfortable to wear. Let's bring some socks. Your feet will get cold when you're in labour, so bring some nice, soft, comfortable socks to keep your feet warm and to make you feel warm and safe. If you've got a really, really good 20-week scan photo, bring those in with you and put them on the wall. A lot of women find it really powerful walking towards those photographs when they're in labour and thinking this is the day that this baby is, is coming. It's a really powerful message. We always have lavender on labour ward. We have some massage oil as well so the midwife can make up some massage oil for your partner and we can show your partner how to massage your back, your hands or your feet, whatever you find helpful or we can make you up a lavender bath. And we do know that lavender is incredibly important when you're in labour. It increases the length, strength and frequency of your contractions and it also helps you relax. A lip salve or some Vaseline because your lips will get very dry when you're in labour. Pop it on your lips, it will keep them feel nice and moist and that will make you feel more comfortable. I think for us, we just, we feel a little bit safer at the thought of going to the hospital for the first time. In yeah, especially when it's living about 10 miles away. Yeah. I appreciate getting in and it can take you're a bit, in safe hands. It can take a bit of time to get in sometimes, can't it? And yeah. I just think we'd feel happier. Okay. Yeah, whereas I feel um, safer in my own home, my own environment. Um, I'm looking forward to using my own bath, um, you know, walking up and down my own stairs. Yeah. And I'm Darren, I'm one of the Labour Ward Coordinators in Lincoln County. And Darren has very kindly offered to help me demonstrate how the use of hot towels is very effective when you're in labour. Kneeling on the floor, kneeling over the birthing ball, and what it does mean is that you as a partner can give really good massage. So between the contractions, nice, slow, gentle massage, it's really soothing, it'll help her relax during the contractions. And then when a contraction comes, what she will need, you need some pressure low down here with the thumbs or with the heel of your hand. Now the towels we spoke about earlier, have the bucket that you brought or we can have one with some really hot water in, as hot as you can stand. And then when the contraction's coming, take out the towel, you wring it out and then you lay it across the back and hold it there in place during a contraction. How does that feel? It's nice, it's nice to sort of feel that he's there without necessarily seeing him. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, just feeling that contact, yeah. Nice strong massage mm. there and pressure and moving those hips from side to side, that, that really helps. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So that's really good, you've got some nice contact there, lovely, lovely and close together and you'll be able to sleep nicely between the contractions and just rest. How long will my labour last? And it's the one question that midwives can't answer. All you have to do is work with each contraction. Each contraction you've had is one that won't come again. Maybe a good analogy is to think about standing on a track at a railway station. You can't see where the next station is, but each contraction is a step along that track. Each contraction takes you nearer to the station, and when you come around the corner and the station is in the distance, then you'll get your second win because you know the end is in sight. nice slow steady breath in and a nice slow breath out. So to control the breath out you can either put your top teeth on your bottom lip because you can't get the breath out quickly or have a sort of pretend there's a lit candle on you just wanting to blow it out okay. The lads it's really important that you don't tell them when to breathe in and out but just say right come on stay nice and calm nice and relaxed massage her, hold her, tell her that you love her, okay? You'll be really worried as to what to do to help, um, but just being there, holding her and encouraging her is very, very powerful, okay? So, what we can do is get yourself nice and comfy, legs down, hands turned up for most on your, on your legs, because that will keep your legs nice and relaxed. Four steady breaths in and out at your own rate, okay?
and you can see that it's kind of quite powerful because you really start to just concentrate on the breathing. You're really focusing on what's happening inside uh, and that's very important. We're going to talk about the powers now, the third P, okay? And these are, these are controlled by three hormones oxytocin, adrenaline and the endorphins. We'll start with oxytocin, that's a hormone that's produced in the head, in the pituitary gland, and it's the oxytocin that drives the length, strength and frequency of the contractions. We have no idea what is the final trigger that starts off labour, but we do know that oxytocin is the hormone that drives the labour. What happens is that oxytocin is released and the baby's head comes down onto the neck of the womb. And there are receptors in the neck of the womb that then send a message back up to the pituitary gland to make more oxytocin. And another contraction comes along. Now we can see that really easily in early labour because women will say that when they're up and around, the contractions are strong and regular. But when they lay down, the contractions ease off. And that's because the baby's head's no longer pressing on the neck of the womb. So that's another really good reason to stay upright and mobile when you're in labour. Keep that baby's head down on the neck of the womb. Keep those contractions coming long and strong. How will I know when my labour's started? And that's really difficult because it starts differently for every single woman. We have no idea what it is that, that triggers off that today is going to be the day. But once it starts, for some women, it will be a strong, steady contraction in a very regular pattern right from the beginning. But for most women, they'll have a latent phase where it'll take a little while that they kind of realise, ooh, this feels a bit different, maybe this is labour. When it's your first baby especially, the cervix is, is long, about three or four centimetres long, and those contractions will efface the cervix so from going from a piece of penne pasta it will shorten up to a spaghetti hoop and then it will slowly start to dilate or open and all of this will happen during that latent phase with those irregular contractions and we do know that you will do that better quicker and more effectively if you're at home relaxed in your own surroundings when the contractions are coming maybe every three to four minutes lasting 50 to 60 seconds and as I say each one is as long and as strong as the last one then we're probably starting to move more into the active phase of labour. Maybe it's a good idea to ring your birth partner up and tell them that things are happening so they can be organised and ready. The really important thing is during this time is get some fluid and get some food on board. You'll be running the equivalent of a marathon while you're in labour. This womb is such a huge muscle, it will use so much energy, you need to what's called carb up, get some carbohydrates on board. So snack small amount on a regular basis, potatoes, banana, pasta, bread, whatever you fancy, and also make sure your fluid intake is good. It's a really important task for your partner when you're in labour to make sure you drink plenty of fluid. Every 10 or 15 minutes they need to be offering you fluid after each contraction because if you get dehydrated or you become hungry, your body won't be able to labour, the contractions will stop. Just ring up the labour ward, you can speak to one of the midwives and she will give you advice. It's better if we can speak to the woman, not that we don't want to speak to the birth partner, but it's great we can talk to them, we can listen to them, probably listen to them during a contraction and see how they're coping with it, what the breathing is like, and we can decide with them whether they're still comfortable at home or whether they feel the need to come in. Now, birth partners will probably want to get you here a little sooner than you're ready to come. That's absolutely fine, that's understandable. They're worried about getting you here, getting through the traffic, finding somewhere to park, and they're probably a little bit worried about maybe your water's going in the car, or even worse, you're having the baby on the way in. That isn't likely to happen, uh, but it's really important that the person who decides when to come in is the woman, because she will know when the time is right. When you arrive at the hospital, get parked, make your way up to the labour ward, and get yourself in, get yourself settled, get your bags unpacked, just have a bit of a chat with the midwife, and you'll slowly relax, you'll feel more at home, 
and then what you'll find is your contractions will return back to the normal pattern they were in before you left and made your way in. The midwife will take some history from you, she'll talk about the pregnancy, she'll go through your birth plan with you and that's really important that you've made that out before you arrive so she's got something to work to with you. Maybe offer you a cup of tea and have a little chat about what's happening um, with the contractions. The midwife may talk about wanting to do an internal examination to see how far advanced the labour is. She doesn't have to, we can look, monitor you, monitor the contractions to get an idea if labour is progressing. But it might be important to you or to her to find out where you are actually in the labour. As the labour progresses the contractions will get longer and stronger and more intense. But if they seem to be dying down or if the midwife examines you and there's no changes with the cervix, one of the things she may talk to you about is breaking your waters. Now, it's quite important if we can try and keep those waters intact because they're there for a purpose. They're there to cushion the baby during a contraction and help it get into a really good position within the womb ready for birth. So think, if your contractions have died down, is there another reason? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Do I need to empty my bladder? It's really important that you keep your bladder empty to make as much room as possible for the baby in the pelvis. Am I anxious about anything? Try and address those things. There are other things we can do to help with the contractions as well. Now, we British are a little bit strange about this, but many cultures use nipple stimulation when a woman is in labour. Any woman who is breastfed will tell you that when the baby is at the breast, that nipple stimulation releases oxytocin and makes the womb contract. So maybe instead of the midwife breaking your waters, you could perhaps go into the bathroom, have a nice soak in a bath, do some nipple stimulation and to see if that will bring the contractions back. Because on the whole, that's so much better than the midwife having to break your waters. As you move towards the end of the first stage of labour, the contractions are really strong, really intense, and they're all encompassing. That's all you can think about. If you see a woman in labour, at this point, she's almost folded in on herself. The contractions have become just quite overwhelming. And every single woman will say the same thing. She will say, I can't do this, I can't do this, I really can't do it. And that's a really good sign because what that does mean is that this baby isn't far away. This is the point where the partner has to be really brave, really strong and say, come on, you can do this, we're nearly there. Look to the midwife, believe in her, believe in yourself. We're now entering the second stage of labour, but what can happen at this point is something called the rest and be thankful stage. What's happened is the baby that was sitting on that cervix, slowly dilating it, the cervix has gone completely, we're at full dilatation, all the cervix has gone, so there's nothing there to trigger those, those contractions. So make the most of this phase. For some women it's only a few seconds, for some women it's several minutes. It's fine, just enjoy the rest, make the most of it. Because the next thing that happens is that the contractions will become expulsive. Now every woman asks, how will I know when I need to push? Well, you won't need to know, your body will just do it. The contractions will become stronger and they'll become expulsive in nature. And you'll just say to us, I need to push. And that's absolutely fine. To start off with, it may be just with alternate contractions, or it may just be at the peak of the contraction. Just go with it, use your breathing, and when you need to push, then just push. What's happening is the baby is moving down now into the vagina. That's what makes the contractions expulsive, and each time you push, it will bring the baby further and further down. Now, what happens at the next point is, that the baby's head meets the pelvic floor. Now that's shaped like that, and it's shaped like that for a reason. Because as the baby comes down in this position, the last thing it hits is the pelvic floor, and that makes the baby turn round for the baby to come into that nice position ready for birth. The downside of having an epidural is that your pelvic floor, instead of being shaped like this, becomes shaped like that. So the problem with that is 
that as the baby's head comes down and hits the pelvic floor, there's nothing to make it rotate around, which means you have to physically push and turn it around, and that's quite hard work. So what often happens in women who've had epidurals is they need a help with this little bit, and so the baby's often born by forceps or by the ventouse. As the baby moves further and further down, the last thing it hits is the skin of the perineum, and that's the area of skin between the vagina and the back passage. As the baby moves down, it will hit the skin of the perineum and start to stretch it, and at that point you'll probably think that you're not too keen on that sensation. The one thing again that everyone asks is, how will a baby that size come out? Well, remember back at the beginning, we talked about how your skin changed, how it stretched. When you were first pregnant, your tummy wasn't this shape. That skin has grown and stretched to make room for that baby. And the same will be true of the skin of the perineum. It will stretch and give for that baby to come out. One thing you can do in the later stages of pregnancy, which is really helpful, is perineal massage. Again, not too, not too British, but you can just pop your thumbs inside the vagina and stretch back towards your bottom with these fingers. Feels quite strange to start off with, but do it on a regular basis. You'll feel that skin stretching. And the other really good thing is that at the point when you're in labor and that baby's head comes down and starts to stretch the skin, you'll know what it is. It's a sensation you'll be aware of and you won't be quite so afraid of it. So with each contraction, the baby's head comes out a little bit more and then goes back and a little more and goes back. That's fine, that's how it's meant to be. That lets that skin stretch slowly, but eventually all of the baby's head will be born. What happens then, either with the next contraction or between, is without anybody doing anything, the baby's head will slowly turn around. And this is how fantastic this design is, okay? Because your body knows that the baby's shoulders won't come out that way, they have to turn around that way to clear the pelvis. We sit there and wait, and with the next contraction, you'll give us another good push, and the baby will just bring itself out and through and into the arms of either yourself or the midwife or your birth partner. Dads, I've got a little story for you. A little while ago, I was looking after a couple who'd been to one of the active birth workshops, and when they came in, the man said, I'm not doing any of that cord cutting malarkey, don't want to be down there, I want to be at the top end. Which was absolutely fine, and he did a fantastic job of supporting his partner. She was kneeling on the chair, he was standing in front, hugging her, giving her the water, doing all the right things. Poor old midwife is on hands and knees on the floor. At the point I can see the baby, I said, oh, it's really fantastic, I can see the baby coming now. And he got really excited. So he came rushing round, got down on the floor and said, oh my God, I can see the baby. And that was it, he never moved. He sat there next to me on the floor, so I gave him a pair of gloves, moved over to one side, and he was the one who took the baby. I clamped and cut the cord, he got up and walked around and said, my God, look at our beautiful baby. And that was such a fantastic experience. Now we're in the third stage of your labour, and that's the delivery of the placenta and the membranes. Now there are two ways of doing this. You can either have an active management or a physiological management. With an active management, as the baby's being born, the midwife will give you an injection into your leg of something called syntometrin. This contains two strong hormones which will make the womb contract down really strongly. She'll then clamp and cut the cord, or obviously your partner or yourself could cut the cord, and then we'll wait for signs of separation. When she sees that happening, the midwife will then gently pull the placenta out and the third stage is completed. The good thing about this is that the third stage is over more quickly and research says you will bleed less at this stage with this active management. But that isn't the way nature intended it to be and if you've actually managed all of the labour with very little or no medical or uh, drug intervention 
then perhaps you could look at having a physiological third stage. In that instance, we do absolutely nothing. The baby will carry on getting oxygen through the cord as it's pulsating, and that can be quite helpful because it's been quite a tough journey for the baby. So as well as getting oxygen from breathing, that extra oxygen will also help. And we wait for the cord to stop pulsating. We still don't do anything because at some point you will start to feel contractions again. And you'll tell us that the contractions are there. You may actually feel if you're still sitting or standing that you can feel the placenta has come down and is ready to be pushed out. It may just fall out or you may just push it out and that's it, it's all done. Now the downside of this is it does take longer and again research says that you will bleed more at the time of the baby's being born. But the bonus for the baby is that while ever that cord is pulsating, the baby is going to be getting oxygen. And that helps as well as the baby breathing, it's also getting oxygen from the cord. There are some instances where the midwife will strongly advise you that you should have an active management of the third stage of labour. So she will discuss that with you. But this is one of the things you need to write down in your birth plan as to how you want this third stage to be managed. Now we're going to talk about adrenaline. Now adrenaline is the bad guy and you all know the sensation that adrenaline gives. It's part of the fight and flight reflex. So your palms go sweaty, your heart beats faster and what's happening is the blood's being taken from the other organs to your heart, and lungs and muscles ready for either fighting or fleeing. The more adrenaline you make, the less oxytocin you make. So it's really, really important that we keep that adrenaline level down to keep the oxytocin level up. That's why you need somebody with you who makes you feel safe, warm, tells you that, you, that you, they love you. Keep the area nice and quiet and dark. Dark is really important. If you leave women alone, they will go and find a quiet, dark corner to have their baby, just like any other mammal. So if you come into labour ward at night and the lights are really bright, dim the lights down low. Make it nice and quiet, nice and relaxing. Dads as well, this is also really important. If you get anxious, she will smell the anxiety, she will smell your fear, and she will start to get really concerned as well. In the transition stage, when she starts to say, I can't do this anymore, you've got to stay calm, you've got to stay focused. Because if you start to get panicking, she will then think, oh my God, he's panicking as well. The adrenaline will zoom up, the oxytocin will go down, and the contractions will just stop. Our final hormone is endorphins, okay? And endorphins are incredibly powerful. People who go to the gym on a regular basis go because they get such an endorphin rush, such an endorphin high. And the good news is, girls, that while you're pregnant, you're starting to make masses of endorphins. You ask any woman what her memory is like since she's become pregnant, and she will tell you without a doubt that it's nowhere near as good as it was before she was pregnant. That's down to the endorphins. And what are your dreams like at night? Provided, of course, you go to sleep long enough to dream. I bet you're sitting there going, oh God, they're really vivid, they're really bright, technicolour, quite scary. And that's all the endorphins doing crazy things in your mind. But the great news is they're there to help with the aches and pains of pregnancy, make it more comfortable for you. Even better, when your contractions start, you start to make massive amounts of endorphins. Your body is just completely flooded with these fantastic hormones. And that's why you watch a woman in labour, she goes from being bright and alert to really drowsy, really withdrawn, and you remember, folds in on herself because of the intensity of the contractions and these fantastic endorphins. So they're really there, they really help with the contractions. So the final reason for endorphins, I believe, is that moment when the baby's born. Because newborn babies aren't always that pretty. The head's often a bit of a funny shape, the ears may be squashed here, the nose is squashed round to the side, maybe covered with a bit of slime and some blood. And without the endorphins, you look at the baby and you think, great. Nine months of pregnancy, all those hours of labour, and that's what I've got. But with the endorphins, you look at that baby and think, my God, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And that's what nature needs. It needs you to think that that is the most beautiful thing and that you are gonna take it and keep it safe. 
Now, one of the things we find is really important is when the babies are born that we do skin to skin contact. But what is important is that we don't do that straight away. Because the other thing that everybody is really worried about is, is my baby going to be okay? So whoever takes the baby, it's really important to remember that it has to be kept at a distance where mum can look at it. Because the study has been done around the world and regardless of race, colour, creed, every woman will do the same thing when her baby's born. She will look at it first and then she will check the head and the arms and the legs to make sure it looks fine. And then she will take it to her, she'll place it here next to her heart so the baby can hear the heart and her breathing will regulate the breathing. And that's so how powerful women are that we all do it the same all around the world. I really hope you've enjoyed the Active Birth Workshop and I hope you found it useful. I wish you all the best with your babies. And remember, birth is a gift that women possess. Women are fantastic.